pleased to um, have Anthony Tussler as our guest to talk about uh, disability services, the history of disability services here at uh, Sonoma State. Um, Anthony was the director and co-founder of um, Disability Resource Center at Sonoma State in 1975. Right. Worked here through 1997. Um, Anthony's highly respected writer, consultant, trainer, advocate uh, on disability issues. I'm pleased to have you here today. Anthony. Thank you. And you're? I am Dr. Lisa Wyatt, and I am the Director of Counseling and Psychological Services as well as Disability Services for Students at Sonoma State. Cool. Uh, I'm Kristen Seaholm. I am a student assistant for DSS as well as a undergrad here at Sonoma State. And you're? Computer science major. Putting together some web materials for mm -hmm. disability services, mm -hmm. which is very cool. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a great project. It is. It's totally awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Sean Keelott, and I worked at Sonoma State since 1996, and I'm the assistant to Provost Eduardo Wichola. I'm Amy Katz, and I'm taking a class to get into the teaching credential program to teach chemistry in high school, but the class itself is teaching adolescents with disabilities, and I've worked a lot with people that are, or adults, rather, that have severe and moderate mental disabilities. Uh-huh. Cool. Very cool. I don't know where to start. Um, let me get... I'm going to do this as quickly as possible because I'd like to have a little more discussion more than anything else. I mean, that, that's a fun thing. But let me just give you the history since that's what you brought me here for. And, um, and that's what you, what you guys are working on, which is, is wonderful. Um, when I was five year old, years old, I was injured. I got a spinal cord injury. I lived in Southern California, and fortunately, the elementary school I went to had one small step into it, and so I could, in my wheelchair, I could get into the elementary school, and this was in 1953, and my parents signed a waiver holding the school not responsible. Also, I'm sure that my mother uh, played mama bear with them and told them they better take me into their school because my family valued uh, intellect. And if they knew that if I went to the special school, I would have got it in a substandard education, which is very true. So I went to this elementary school. The first three grades were on the first floor. Fourth grade was on the second floor, fourth, fifth, and sixth. My job, beginning in the first grade, was to learn how to use braces and crutches, because my spinal cord injury is low enough that I could learn how to use braces and crutches so I could climb to the fourth, to the second floor to the fourth grade. That's the, I mean, it's incomprehensible. I mean, if you know special ed these days, you know, and, and, and ADA and all that, I mean, it's, it, it's amazing, but that's the way it worked in the 50s and 60s. It didn't occur to me, my parents, my teachers, the principal, the school district, that maybe, just maybe, when I got to, to ready to go to the fourth grade, they swapped a class, because that's what they do in inaccessible schools these days, is they swap a class when they need to. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you worked at Stanford, I mean, you think uh, Priority Reg is crazy here. I mean, it's really crazy there, because they're swapping classes like mad, and because they've got all these inaccessible buildings. And thank God, with this place built in 66, and also, since this place built in 66 is relatively accessible. You know, I, I can't, th there's, I can, there's a few places that aren't accessible. There's a uh, control booth for uh, one of the classrooms that wasn't accessible, and maybe in the remodels that's been done. Uh, is, do they still have the, uh, uh, the press box at the football field? Pretty much demolished. Yeah, that's what I, yeah, it was on its way out, yeah. Because that used to be an inaccessible place, too. Um, so I went to school, my whole career came up to uh, Sonoma State because uh, of its uh, psych program, also because I'm a middling student, still I'm a middling student. Um, I couldn't get into UC Santa Cruz as I wished. And I applied for special admit because my SATs, I'm in a classic underachiever, great SATs and just funky grades. Um, I went to Santa Cruz and said I'd like a special admit because I'm, you know, obviously so bright. And they said no, and I didn't realize until 
15 years later, the reason they said no was because I was using crutches. And that campus is oh, spread so out hilly. and it's real hilly. They, didn't, they wouldn't say that to me. But that's why they didn't give me, one of, one of the reasons they didn't give me a special admit. So that meant I came here to Sonoma State who was accepting anybody with a 2.0 and above. I mean, for years, you know, if you had a 2.0, you can get into Sonoma State. Um, part of the history of this place, of why I hesitated in 66, part of the reason this place is as accessible as it is, is that there's a wealthy family in the north part of the county, the Johnsons, and they had a son, Will, who got a spinal cord injury as a quad. And when they started to build this place, the mom came down here and said, you better make this accessible so my son can go here. He ended up going to the most accessible school in those days, which is University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, which is where everybody in wheelchairs went, if they could dress themselves. You had to be independent to go there. Very interesting stuff, but not germane to this. So I came here to Sonoma State. Um, it was a wild time. I, I started to get my BA uh, in 1970. Um, the student newspaper, and I helped contribute to it, got kicked off campus, was defunded. Um, if you want to, there's in the archives, the Sonoma State Steps, you know, there's a picture of the student body president naked, you know, and that really made people unhappy. Um, uh, and then there's the Outlaw Steps, which was, uh, I helped contribute to with some people I knew, and then they finally, using student loan money, bought some equipment to start a newspaper that was headquartered in the community, the Sonoma County Bugle. And I was the photography editor. We did that for three years. So we're up here to 73. All this time, I'm ignoring people with disabilities. I don't want to be around people with disabilities because if I'm seen talking to them, um, you know, it's going to be clear I am one. And I'm trying desperately to pretend that I'm not, even though I'm using braces and crutches. And when I stood, when I'd stand up in a classroom to leave, I mean, you'd hear me a block away you know, rattling and, you know. So, I did not want to be outed, but beginning about 72, 73, I had a roommate who went to the Department of Rehab. I didn't want to finish my BA and the bugle then did, and I was look, I wanted uh, training in the uh, printmaking, in printing there's some photography stuff that they used to do, they do digitally now. And I wanted to get training that, so I went to the Department of Rehab I met a woman in a bar, the Trade Winds, who was starting to provide disability services here on campus. She worked for the Dean of Student in a trainee position, Joanne Schechter, and she had graduation. Uh, she took on disability services, some couple other things. It was a trainee position, which probably doesn't even exist anymore. She convinced me to come here to the university and see what was going on. It was still a college in those days. And I don't know why I came. I was thinking about it this morning. I, I usually joke that I was inter more interested in her than what she was doing, but I'm not sure that's true. Um, there's some truth, and I was more interested in her. Um, so I came here to the campus, and I met a guy, Steve Diaz, his best man at my wedding. We're still friends. Um, who... He's a wheelchair user. He, is, he had a black sense of humor about disability. He was just fearless about saying anything. And, much to my chagrin, he was hipper than I am. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've always valued is being hip. <laughs> I mean, it just, I mean it, it's a little embarrassing, but that's... The, the example I use is that I was talking to him one day about the Three Penny Opera, the, uh, written by Brecht and Vile. Uh, you know, Brecht did a lot of radical he was a stuff in Germany and the United States. And, well, I had the English language version, and Steve had the original German language version, you know, clearly trumping my <laughs> hipness. And so what that did was it made me realize that my conception, my prejudice in stereotyping of people with disabilities as being helpless, kind of nerdy, kind of people you don't want to be around, was false. Here was somebody who was clearly none of those things, and he had a disability. And that helped me make that switch to realize I was a disabled person. 
and I had a strong political background growing up, you know, with liberal parents in the 50s. I mean, classic kind of story of the, uh, you know, they weren't communists or socialists, but they were still part of that. You know, and during McCarthyism, there was still fear about being a liberal in the 50s. And I came of age during the, the great civil rights struggle in the United States. And so I'd worked on the African American civil rights. I'd worked on the anti-war movement. You know, I rented a mimeograph machine for a while so I could print out uh, po flyers in my bedroom. You know, it was before uh, Xerox machines. God, that would have been wonderful. <laughs> um, and computers, you know. Um, and so I had this political viewpoint and sensibility, civil rights, self-determination sensibility, and all of a sudden, I discovered that I was part of a group that was disenfranchised, that was discriminated against. And as I was saying earlier, um, as we were chatting, we didn't know what disability was at that point. We really didn't. We didn't have any role models. I mean, we had FDR. Uh, you know, Roosevelt was the president during the 30s, who everybody knew he had a disability, but he kept it hidden. You know, there's only two pictures of him in this wheelchair. Mm -hmm. You know, so the only models we had were things like that. Positive role models. I'm talking where disability is valued. We didn't even know to talk about disability being valued. We didn't think about us as a community saying, you need to make these places accessible. You need to bring little Tony's fourth grade class down to the first level, you know, the the bottom floor so he can go to school easily. It was a shift from an individual focus, whereas if you could do it, they'd let you in if you knocked on the door hard enough, to a model where we started to make the world accessible. We have made a profound change over the last 35 years in the built environment. I mean, huge. You know, to have jobs like you guys have, like I had, you know, it was unthinkable even in the mid-70s. You know, it's a profound change. The example I use is, okay, here I was using braces and crutches to climb stairs to get to where I needed to go. I could do that, so I got to do that. I know some wheelchair users who were in similar situation in the same time period, uh, typically women, who had the football players carry them upstairs every time they needed to go upstairs and back down the stairs. Um, you know, so if you could do it, so there I was, braces and crutches to climb the stairs to what we have now, which is elevators and ramps. They wouldn't think of building a two-story building without an elevator these days. Whereas in the early 70s, they did. Ives Hall did not have an eleva elevator when it was built. There's a ramp to the ground floor. They said, okay, wheelchairs can get there. You know, the kind of the, the subfloor. There's a ramp to the main floor, you know, and to hell with the offices up above. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the planner here, Wes Burford, when he, built, when he designed it, had two, three storage cabinets, right, storage closets right above each other, knowing that the world might change and that they might be able to put it in an elevator. And at some point, we got the money and they put it in an elevator, and that's why there's an elevator in Ives. Partially by our advocacy, you know, the directors at that time, and partially by the the supreme wisdom of, of somebody like Wes Burford. I mean, wonderful guy, just wonderful. So that's what I really, that's, that's what my career, I mean, so here it is, you know, I, I, I suddenly find a community, I find a way of thinking about myself that's positive, I come home in a really profound way, and I get a place to work that through here at Sonoma State. I get a job, we start bringing in money. We hit an up curve where we started to be able to bring in more and more money. At one point, I can't remember what our budget was, but we had, I don't know what's, how many FTE? Uh, four and a half, five FTE? I mean, <laughs> I mean we were fat. We were in, we were in the, the ground floor <coughs> of Stevenson, where you are right now, mm -hmm. where Ochoa's office is. Yeah, 1041. We're, we're right around the corner from the president, the provost. I mean, we we're in prime real estate. Boy, were they happy to see me go here. <laughs> because I had been able to 
And it was, it was propped up on my personality, I'm sorry to say. I thought it was p policy that was doing it. But when I left, a lot of this was dismantled because I wasn't around anymore. Um, it was unthinkable for them at that stand, that in those days, to not have us in a central place, because I argued we had to be close to parking. Mm -hmm. You know, and they, they bought that argument. Once Armagnana came in, once the one big check came in, <clears throat> I mean, Armin Yana came to our staff meeting, and he told us explicitly he did not believe in supporting diversity programs like ours. I mean, not that he 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 wanted to uh, dismantle them, but he didn't that we shouldn't have any uh, protected status because at that point our funds were protected. You know, so I was always battling the dean of students who wanted to find some way to get at my budget and and be able to put somebody else in student affairs on that budget, and that you know. Poor Rand and I, I mean, it, uh, Rand Link was the Dean of Students here for years and he died relatively soon after he left here. I mean, he used and I used to battle it out on a regular basis as he tried to find some way to get at that money. <laughs> you know, and I, I wanted to support him, I wanted to support the university, but I also had a prime mission, so there's always the balance I played. You know, I wasn't a hard ass about it, but I was clear about what I was, I was working on, what was important. So that's essentially what happened, and when we kept building the program, we kept. I was a, a, a strong voice among the uh, uh, the disability directors on the statewide level. So when we both wrote the funding formula, I mean, I just about threw myself on the floor and kicked my heels and yelled and screamed to fight for funding for the smaller campuses. Mm -hmm. What they wanted to do was to have half-time director for anybody under an FTE of 7,500, you know, and then a full time, and then one and a half FTE over a certain size. You know, and I, I argued and won that there's a certain base that you have to have no matter this, what size the university. You have to have a full time director, you have to have a full time secretary, and you need a full time counselor. That was the base. We could go up from there, but if you didn't have that, and this was the beginning of, you know, and I was successful in that. I mean, one of the proudest moments I have was I sat down with, got to be good at names until now, I don't have her name at the, the ready. She was um, in the chancellor's office at the UC, no, the president's office, which is the, like, like our chancellor, the president's office, the UC. She and I sat down and uh, wrote budget language that went into legislation on how to fund the three systems. Mm -hmm. The, uh, disability programs. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, what a wonderful, I mean, that's the other thing that this has done, is it's allowed me to be places I never would have been because disability is so brand new that even today, I get, where, just about wherever I go, I'm the first one there and I get to do what I want and it is so much fun. <laughs> you know, and so to be able to, um, I was just thinking, it's like, I'd go crazy if I was you guys, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it, you're not the first ones there, you know? And, it, it, and it's temperament, too. I'm not saying that you have my temperament, you know? So I would go crazy, because I like new, shiny things. <laughs> um, so to be the, the, the opportunity to write legislature, you know, it's just, I mean, it's wonderful. And I wouldn't have been, been able to do that without being in disability services and having a vision for what it should be and an understanding of how the whole thing worked and how the smaller universities and how the CSU had to be comparable to the community colleges. And so always politics, strategy, with this burning you know, desire for equity and value for disability. And, so that's, and really, it was about 1994 that we pretty much got done what we could do. The ADA was here. The ADA changed everything. Even with 504, Section 504 of the 1973 Rehab Act um, gave students with disabilities civil rights, but nobody knew about it. And even if you went to a, a dean and said, you know, here's the federal legislation, you need to do this, you know, it's, it, they'd never heard of it. You know, there's tons of things that they have to worry about. And if they haven't heard about it, and it's not going to bite them on the ass, they're not going to do it. That's still true. You know, we thought that ADA was going to be a big hammer for us to get things done. 
You know, and after a while they said, okay, where's the lawsuits? You know, without the lawsuits, you know, there wasn't quite the fire under them. So I, uh, to, to finish my story, uh, 94, I got promoted. In 97, um, I turned 50 and retired on my 50th birthday from here, which allowed me in the PERS retirement system to be able to get full medical, which as a disa disabled person was invaluable. Mm -hmm. And I got a small uh, amount of money coming in. Because when you retire at 50, your multipliers, not much. You guys probably don't know about multipliers, but it's the n how old you are. You get a bigger m multiplier for the number of years you've been here. So at age 50, your, my multiplier was 1.2. So I got 24% of my salary is my, is my pension. If I had stayed till 55, my multiplier would have been higher and I would have gotten 50%. But I was ready to get out of here. And so I went to uh, Santa Rosa JC, you know, it was kind of like the uh, rebound girlfriend, you know, it was, it was, <laughs> <laughs> oh, she looks good, okay. You know, and then I got there and it's like, what did I see in her? <laughs> and so it took me three years to get out of there and I, you know, I haven't uh, gone back since. Um, and what I've been doing since is I've worked for the World Institute on Disability, doing technology stuff. Uh, right now I'm developing uh, disaster preparedness for people with disabilities for the county. Um, Rain some alcohol and drug. You know, I'm developing a program for alcohol and drug prevention for people with disabilities. I mean, it's never been done in this country. It's brand new stuff. Um, other kinds of things like that. So that's really the arc. And what? I, and I brought this just. Oops, there in the cross, there's a few spider webs. Just to show you how you. what we were able to do back then. This is a monograph. This was printed with state funds. If you don't like nudity, don't read it. If you don't like the F word, don't read it. Somebody, we were going to press and somebody said, do you think we can say this? And I got to go into Dr. Benson's office and him saying, okay, what's the story here? And I said, well, it's a poem. It was written by this disabled person. It was in our art show. He says, is it art? And I said, yeah, it's art. He said, okay, if it's art, I'm not gonna complain. So you can go ahead and print it. And that's kind of the way things work around here. So this is a, um, a reproduction of the, uh, the poster that we sent out looking for artworks. What this is documents an art show that we had here in the early 80s, 1981. Mm -hmm. And it is in the United States, perhaps worldwide, is the first art show for artists with disabilities where the subject matter is disability. Previous to this, certainly Sister Kenny Institute had art shows for people with disabilities, but very rarely did it have dis a disability um, subject matter. People stayed away from it just like I did before I came home to the disability community. And so it was a major show. We had a lot of student assistant money, and we spent it like hand over fist. There's a photography here, Don Lee Phillips, who's still around. Um, Actually, it was a staff person, Odette Osborne, who died in a uh, car crash on her way to Chico to a job interview. Tragic loss. And uh, Irby George was, was a guy, a student here with uh, cystic fibrosis who did some wonderful art. And he's cystic fibrosis. Most people with CF, he died in his late 20s. Uh, so the four of us uh, juried the show. It was a major show. We did it in the art gallery you know, the major art gallery. Um, I mean, it's dumbfounding what a wonderful thing it was. Um, uh, it had a, I know, something like 110 pieces by over 50 artists. There's some wonderful work in there. Just, I mean, strong, strong work. And uh, it toured the United States and the tour schedules. We got an NEA grant, and if you look at the back, uh, you can see where it toured. <coughs> There's video, there's performances. Um, we had the Outrageous Beauty Review in the Commons on a Saturday night. The Outrageous Beauty Review is a cult of wheelchair, of wheelchair users in Berkeley with able-bodied 
attractive young women, and they put on a show. And um, there was a lot of nudity. There's a lot of weird stuff. It was outrageous. It was wonderful. I mean, it was just the two. I was thinking about this today. I mean, the, the, the two pieces they did, the two set pieces they had, what they did is a lot of lip syncing to music. There's a guy with cerebral palsy. His speech was almost unintelligible. Um, he could walk if he walked on his knees. He used a wheelchair most of the time. So he came out, knee walking, in a tux, started singing, and, and, and I couldn't tell what he was singing until he got to the chorus, which was my way. And I was like, so cool. So cool. I mean, so in your face and provocative. The other piece that night that really got me was um, uh, there's a guy who's a quad, skinniest quad I've ever seen, in a power wheelchair, and his attendant comes in dressed like a nurse, and it ends up being this discipline and bondage, sadomasochistic scene where she's stripped down to her um, uh, fishnet stockings and a, you know, almost nothing, and, and has tied him down and is whipping him with it, uh, surgical tubing, all to some wild music. I mean, it was just like, they can't do this. You can't do this, it, which I love. I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't even know if you could do this, you know, in, in, a, in another public performance space, let alone the, the university. I mean, yeah. Think about it. Uh, justifying this to your boss, <laughs> it'd be tough. Um, tattooed vegetables for uh, a number of students who are. Uh, oh, there's a videotape. That's cool. Jennifer Boswick, Botwick did a dance. Uh, Leslie Rumpf did some uh, a poetry reading. So it was the per first really disability festival, disability arts festival I know of in the United States. It was a whole month of things plus this show, and it's just um, it's wonderful, wonderful pieces. I mean, I, I found myself it really helped change how I viewed the world by seeing some of this art. Because, I mean, an art can, can move me in, in, in ways that nothing else can. It kind of slipped by my sensor and my radars and just kind of... There are some, some shots, small color shots of people with intellectual deficit, disabilities and something about seeing those in kind of the straightforward way it was shown. It wasn't like Diane Arbus. It wasn't as, as freaks. It wasn't as... They weren't glorified. It was just kind of everyday kind of shots, really well done. They really kind of moved me along around people with intellectual deficits. It's this it's right there at the bottom. And then on the right-hand side of that page, what I'm looking at here is, um, is this page. This was a series of photographs. These guys were both Vietnam War veterans. Uh, this guy had facial disfigurements, and this guy uh, had PTSD pretty severely. Post-traumatic stress disorder, oh, okay. which is what they're coming back from Iraq with in gotcha. big numbers. Um, and it was a series of ten photographs, each pairs portraits of them. So it was a, you know, two rows of five. And it kind of con compare and contrast the two of them. And it really helped, you know, get, you know, would it be worse to have a, a an emotional disability? Would it be worse to be burned? I mean, what, what is that life like? And that these two pieces were able to do that for me. You know, I, mean, I, I think that's enormously important. So anyway, that's, that's the basic history. Let me hear from you guys. I mean, what, what interests you? I mean, that's kind of the emotional arc, the, the political arc, because that to me is what's important. You know, I think if you can, if you can have that burning in your heart, Whatever your goal is, I mean, whatever that, I mean, I'm sure that at least the two of you have some overarching goal for your vocational life. Something that has you choose a job, has you move on from a job, gives you satisfaction in a job when it's not meant, makes you go home, well, you too, go home and go, oh, what a rotten day. You know, and I think the better you can figure out what that is, and the more you can be true to it, the more effective you can be. As I was talking to Brent earlier, that's important, but at the same time, you gotta, you gotta count heads, you gotta do the basic stuff you gotta do to survive 
in any large institution. You know, you have to justify your program. You have to show why you're valuable. You have to provide the direct services. I mean, if students aren't getting accommodated tests, you're not doing your job. It may not be the most exciting thing. It may not really even be something that, that fans that fire. But if they don't get those accommodated tests, you're not doing your job. So you got to do it. At least that's the way I looked at it. You know, I didn't see anything thrilling in accommodated tests. Mm -hmm. It was interesting going to faculty who wouldn't allow it. You know, and talk with them and see, see if I can move them towards providing it, see why they should provide it, both as a civil rights issue, but also as a, a realistic re level, because most people don't see disability accurately. You know, particularly learning disabilities. That's a, that's a huge one. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys, I'm sure, still, you know, you can't see it. Right. It strikes at the heart of what the university is, which is the intellect. You know, and so it's, it's, it's a tough sell. So in that sense, you guys do have, you know, a real mountain to climb. I'm wondering how the students embraced the, the opening of the office on, on campus at that time. Were they willing and want, wanting to uh, obtain those kind of services from your office, or were they still kind of not wanting to identify themselves as a person with a disability? Um, it was wonderful throughout most of the time up until the late 80s, that if a person walked through, walked through the front door, they had worked through their own disability issues enough to come seek help. And so 98% of the people who came through the front door who said they had disabilities did. The few who didn't were people who um, wanted to slide by on some close-in parking. You know, that was, the, that, was the only, that was what they wanted. But until there was accommodated testing, you know, and, and, and lengthen testing. Um, so there's lots of people out there who didn't identify as being people with disabilities, but the ones who came through the front door were and either needed the services, like close-in parking, because we're the ones who certified it, mm -hmm. or other services that we provide. In the very beginning, it was a lot of us just hanging out in the office. I mean, there's a lot of hanging out that happened. You know, and there's a lot of... Um, you know, there's parties and relationships and, uh, you know, it, it was a wild time. You know, I mean, if you want to read the nitty gritty, there's a oral interview that was done with me by uh, UC Berkeley Bancroft Library. I tried to be as candid as possible because I got sober in 83. And so I can talk about using alcohol and drugs pretty freely because that's part of my public persona, my professional persona now. Whereas a lot of the people got interviewed, you know, when, when they're looking at, uh, you know, a, sent, uh, a United States Senate uh, uh, approved position in an administration, they're not going to talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll publicly. You know, I think some of that stuff, when they die, there's, they're going to let it. But anyway, you can read mine, and I, I try to be as candid as possible. Um, and we just, you know, we did a lot of guerrilla kinds of things. And so the people who were interested in that kind of came by. And there's a few people who came by who weren't uh, into that kind of thing but saw us as valuable, and we didn't force them into anything. I used to have a picture of George Wallace, who was the governor of Alabama, racist, segregationist, who was shot, and he used a wheelchair, and he ran for president uh, using a wheelchair. And I used to picture, Abaddon took a picture of him, and I had that on my wall, to remind myself that just because somebody used a wheelchair, they didn't have the same politics I did, or same <coughs> worldview, because I had to respect the students who came through the front door. They didn't want to be radical. They didn't have to. From my perspective, they had to take care of themselves. But other than that, you know, whatever they wanted to do. I tried to create in that office that when you walked through that door, it would be the one place in the university where your disability was valued and where you were respected because of your disability identity, not in spite of. It's, it's not easy to do. and We weren't always successful. So the students, they came by, they, they hung out a lot. <clears throat> Ultimately what happened was we started to think that the best thing was for students to be out in the university and not just hanging out and using us as a, uh, an escape. And so we pushed them out and then we started to bring them back again mm -hmm. toward the end, but it was, it was hard, it wasn't, wasn't as easy to do. So there's different ways that we saw it and also different times now how students saw themselves. 
were most students more the visible kinds of disabilities? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it was wheelchair users, you know, would generally come in, uh, blind, deaf. Um, our first person with a learning disability, don't have her name, she ended up being a valedictorian here. <coughs> she was a, um, do you remember her name? Uh, no, it's on one of the pictures. That yeah, yeah, we, we office. yeah, Scott and I managed to dredge up a whole bunch of stuff out of my head. <laughs> um, she came into the office, she was referred by the um, reentry program. Is there still a reentry program? No? E EOP. Yeah, but this was reentry for not, anyone. EOP's not the same. Yeah. Right, right. It's not really a re it's no, not Yeah, because really you, you have to qualify for EOP. It's a yeah. needs-based yeah. program. Um, yeah. So there's a reentry program in those days. It was very active. This woman came in. She had a severe learning disability. And when she drove onto campus, if she knew where she was going to park, she could do okay. If she had to drive up and down looking for a parking place, she was screwed. So they referred her to our office. She sat down and I talked with her. I didn't know anything about learning disabilities. She had severe figure uh, directionality, reversal. Uh, her wayfinding skills were miserable. She used to give us a call period. I mean, you know, Joan. You know, Joan would call and, and uh, you know, where are you? I don't know. Well, look, look around the phone. You know, what room number is it? You know, because the room numbers are kind of distinctive on campus. What do you see? And she'd tell us, okay. You're in the ground floor of Darwin. Okay, can you see, you know, and, and I'd be able to get her out of Darwin and get her to Stevenson. No, you know, no wonder. And so what she wanted from us was a parking place, a close-in parking place. It made sense to me. You know, this was somebody who fell outside the norm, who needed something. The same was true with people that were left-handed. There's a lot of left-handed tablet armchairs in this place mm -hmm. because we put the screws to purchasing. There weren't for a long time. There's only right-handed tablet armchairs. You know? <laughs> and so we took that on as well. People who were, um, who were fat, we took that on. You know, I, I see the 10 as being pretty big. You know, and it's certainly under the ADA and under the Office of Civil Rights, it's not nearly that big. You know, I'm hoping to see some changes with uh, the new laws that have gone in. But. That's what we continually try to promote is more of a un universal design approach to Absolutely. the physical environment as well as the educational environment. Right. And that's, that's a wonderful strategy. I mean, universal design is great. I mean, because it is, it, um, you know, it helps everyone. You know, everyone. universal design? Yeah. No? It's the notion that um, you design everything for the broadest group of people possible. Okay. And so I think what it was was a strategy to kind of um, promote building ramps and things. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I still don't know how they used to have these when the, uh, this used to be the library and downstairs was uh, information technology and part of it. And um, there used to be, they'd have these big carts of something that they would take from admissions and records, which was in Stevenson where counseling is now, and bring them over here. They'd go back and forth. And the, the, there's a ramp on the far side to be able to get up to this level, and there's a ramp way down there, but there's nothing in the middle. I don't know how they got those, those things up here. You know, I mean, you know, but eventually we started building ramps, you know, and there's the ramp that goes outside the, from the Stevenson courtyard up to the, the walkway, mm -hmm. you know, and that ramp all of a sudden got used by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, so the idea of universal design is, okay, we're seeing all these people use it, people with baby carriages, people with wheeled carts of all kinds, people who don't want to climb stairs. What's the, oh, if we, design, if we design it in the way which we know to design, like with ramps, it'll work for a lot of people, and so they came up with this notion of universal design. And they've, they've brought it into the teaching arena, too. And they're working with that. And that's, which is people, you know, <coughs> kinesthetic, learners, I don't know, oral, visual. You teach to all those modalities. So you reach all the students. And I'll bet you that's not happening very much on this campus. Well, actually, actually, we're fortunate to have the ENACT grant on, right, right. on our campus. There's some real uh, activists here yeah. who, are, who are working to make it happen. Yeah. But I get there's some, some faculty my age who are still standing up in front of the blackboard, still talking, you know, and if, and if you're not an oral, you know, I mean, a 
and a hearing listener, you're in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. Questions? Thoughts? So when I, when I started, I had an appointment with you because I was an employee with a, a with a well I work hearing aids. Oh, okay. But um, when did but this makes it sound like it was always the Office of Stu for Students with Disabilities. It was, did you, it was. Did you see employees? Yeah. I mean, you know, I um, mean, you know, they, if, if they came in the front door, but never explicitly. Oh. I mean, because they, they, I mean, as I said, the tent, you know, okay. if you got a disability, you know, we provided services, students, faculty, and but staff. But like human services didn't have, yeah. they didn't have somebody, they're the ones that referred me to you. Right, I yeah. I guess I always thought at that time that you covered everyone on we the did. campus community. We did. Yeah. Oh. You know, I mean, when it was the Disability Resource Center, we provide oh. services to all people on the campus with disabilities explicitly at that point. Okay. Yeah, because there's, I mean, there's like a definite line. Right. It's, now it's, there's no. And, I mean, that's part of the rationale they had to make me Director of Compliance and Risk Management was to, to have me be doing workers' comp, oh. injury and illness prevention. Yeah. What else did I have? Something else. Risk management, of course, uh, which is not so much disability related. But actually, that made some sense with uh, uh, workers' comp. I mean, I talked with one person who, you know, I was able to say to her really clearly, because I had this disability experience, you need to get out of here. This job is killing you. And it seems like your, job, your life is over now. But believe me, this is an opportunity for you to go off and do something different. And I think you need to. Because if you keep doing this, I would take the money and run, is essentially what I told her. And she did, thank God, you know, because I think it might have killed her. You know, I didn't get to tell that to Rand, unfortunately. Then I think the job did kill him. Let that be a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think? Uh, I find it really interesting because when I got, I used to work at Old Adobe Developmental Center. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Arizona. I was an instructor's assistant full time last summer, and uh, I remember getting hired. And the the director who retired in December told me the whole history of like how people started institutions and oh, cool. how they developed these programs and what I did over the summer was that I took these people everywhere. And Great. We do all sorts of fun things and uh, it made their lives a whole lot more meaningful. Well, everyone's life a whole lot so more meaningful. More. And, um, and uh, I think it's really good to have people with disabilities to be able to be a part of the entire community as much as possible because um, like for instance, I took a, um, a not a psychology class, but a philosophy class, and we'd be going through things like lifeboat ethics, and um, you know, you're on a boat, who are you gonna throw off? And they'd always throw off, you know, the person with the bad attitude, the person with the disabilities, or something like right, that. Right, right. That's like, it's too bad because in working with these people, um, like. Um, it's just made life so much more meaningful for them because they're out and doing what they want to do and going to college or whatnot, but also for us who don't have disabilities because like, I get to do so many things so much easier than other people and it makes me appreciate my life so much more. Cool. Yeah. I mean, that was, I mean, starting when we did in the 70s and I mean, when we were on the second floor of Stevenson, that's where the Dean of Students office used to be, um, somebody was doing primal scream therapy down in the counseling office, you know, and you'd hear this, you know, these, these, these wails, you know, and it'd be like, what is that? You know, oh, primal screen, okay. Um, so I guess you've heard of primal screen, and you're not so young. Uh, <laughs> no, not so young. <laughs> but I'm sure. In fact, the primal screen institute in, in Los Angeles, I used to work right next door to there. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, yeah, you probably did, yeah, yeah. Um, it was a wild time. I mean, the women's movement was coming together. You know, I learned a lot from the women's uh, community and seeing their struggle. Um, GLBT was not so big on the campus at that point. And actually, it's never been particularly big. It's always been kind of woven through, but never real high visibility. African-American, I mean, the Black Students Union was, was happening then. 
There's a lot more African-American students on campus in those days. Sonoma State had a strong basketball program, and so they recruited heavily out of LA and uh, the San Francisco urban Bay Area, and so we got a lot of African-Americans coming to Sonoma, Sonoma County, to Sonoma State. Uh, the Latino uh, struggle to a certain extent, and so people with intellectual disabilities were also part of that, figuring all this stuff out, you know, and that whole um, normalization, you know, that if people with intellectual disabilities, instead of dressing them like children and treating them like children, maybe if you encourage them to dress like other adults, get haircuts like other adults, treat them like adults, they'll act more like adults. Yeah. It was absolutely true. It was absolutely true. I gave a presentation at Becoming Independent a couple weeks ago, and I was looking around and, and looking at the haircuts and the clothing styles, you know, and they're no different than anybody else you'd see on the street for their age even, mm -hmm. which I thought was cool. The people in their 20s, you know, the baseball cap, people older, you know, dressing more like me. And so that, it was all part of that same mix, that same stew as we were figuring out borrowing from each other. I mean, I used to call UC Berkeley, that was, that was the place. You know, I said, what do you guys do? You know, one, <laughs> you're not gonna believe this. At one point we said, maybe we needed to at least get the phone numbers of our students so we know who, who, you know how to get in touch with them if we needed to. And so I said, well, what, what does Berkeley do? Okay, so we called them up and they said, well, we, you know, we, we've got a card on them and we have their name and address and phone number and maybe, uh, uh, in case of emergency. Oh, okay, that makes sense to me. <laughs> so that's what we did. That's, that's the totality of the paperwork we would keep on students. Wow. And I've always fought bitterly to have less paperwork. You know, and if you go to the community colleges these days, <clears throat> it's, it's amazing the amount of stuff they get from the students and how, I think, useless it is in doing their real job. So is there a one o'clock in here? What? Is there a one o'clock class in here? Yeah. Bomber. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to briefly just, I was thinking about legacy and um, I am just so glad that the concrete ramps are made out of concrete here that I helped design and put in because it's going to take a lot of money to, uh, to get those out of here. And um, so that assures my legacy because, you know, it's, it's not like it was when I was here. I mean, we had a heyday. You know, and everybody had, you know, and it was wonderful. And you're still doing, and you still have the opportunity, doing really wonderful work. And without the work that you guys do, there's a lot of students who could not be here. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking particularly of those with learning disabilities who, mm -hmm. I mean, they're just, they've been marginalized their whole life. Mm -hmm. That's you about 60% of the students we serve. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, one of the things in getting this place more accessible was that Students who use wheelchairs could get in easy. So some of them we didn't even see anymore. Right. You know, there's a few that I'd run right. down in the hallway. Right. Say, hey, hi, I'm Anthony. Right. What's hey, your name? Right. You know, but students with learning disabilities, you know. So that, that is, this is your golden age. Mm -hmm. Doesn't feel like it a lot of the time, but it is, <laughs> believe me. I just wanted to um, thank you for your participation. Oh, thank time. you, thank you. Something to Certificate of Appreciation, and you got my master's on there, too. I mean, <laughs> Rehabilitation Administration. It was a program that was around the heyday, too. And it lost its federal funding, and the uh, University mm. of San Francisco said, oops, bye. Mm. <laughs> Just sad. Thank you. So thank you all yeah, for being here. You. Yeah, Are you yeah. coming yeah. this afternoon? Of course, yeah. I am. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm even going to put on my wool slacks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, actually.